Hi, so I appreciate the title may have been a, a little misleading. I mean, it isn't, but it may have made you think you were coming to see something you're not. So if you're coming to see a um, mysterious device that harnesses the power of gravity to generate electricity, I'm sorry to disappoint you. What this is about is about gravity batteries. And gravity batteries are awesome in themselves and really worth knowing about, but they are really just batteries that keep the reactants separate by the force of gravity. Now, if what you were expecting was a gravity machine, you're probably best just, just skipping and, and moving on, really. If you're interested in um, manufacturing cheap batteries that you can use yourself at home that are um, very low skilled to make and do a really quite good job, then you'd probably be a good idea if you watch the video, you may well enjoy it. Anyway, I thought I'd put that right at the beginning because I understand that people may have clicked on the video expecting one thing, end up getting something else and be quite upset about it. Okay, that said. Now, I'm absolutely fascinated by our turn of the century technology and I have a whole bunch of this stuff called the Model Engineer and Amateur Electrician. Now it started publication, I think it was uh, 1898, 1899, something like that. 1976 they did a whole lot of facsimile reproductions of the early editions and I bought a bunch of them when I was 25 and I've had them ever since and they're absolutely stuffed with really interesting um, articles on steam engines, uh, gramophones, Wimhurst machines, uh, wiring up your own dynamos, all kinds of stuff, including batteries. We have a bit of a modern obsession with batteries, or we think we do. We, we think that we're obsessed with getting better and better batteries. But actually, when you read this stuff, you find that this has been an obsession since the 1800s, right the way through. It's absolutely amazing. Now, a lot of stuff that you find done when research is done, really, it's, it's a question of looking what went before and then almost updating it with modern methods and materials. And, and that can be a really valuable and interesting way of proceeding when looking for something new. Have a look at what went before and then update it with modern materials. And it can be just very, very fruitful. So I'm going to do a series of um, videos, really, on the batteries that are contained in this stuff. Because if we look at those and develop them with modern materials, there is a high probability of generating something brand new. Now, back then, there was a whole group of batteries called gravity batteries, and they were extremely popular because people didn't have the same kind of stuff that we've got. They didn't have wall outlets. So if they wanted to make an electrical machine and wanted to make a, a lead acid battery, which they called an accumulator, and charge that accumulator, they needed a source of uh, primary energy. And for that, they were using these gravity batteries an awful lot of the time. And so they were extremely popular. They obviously fell out of favour. Obviously, nobody really knows about them anymore, which is just amazes me, but it, nobody knows about them, and they're extremely simple to make and very robust. So there's a whole host of them. I'll be covering some of the more interesting ones that I think we can replicate and improve upon, being the whole point of it. And I've chosen this one to start with. It's from Volume 4, which was published in 1901, and it's a gravity battery based on zinc and copper. Now, the writer of the article says that he ran his batteries for months at the time without having to attend to them. He'd just make up a bank of them and leave them for two, three months, and then every two or three months, go back and have a look at them and maybe refresh them. When you're thinking about the care that a lead-acid battery bank takes these days, actually, that's a surprisingly um, efficient lack of maintenance little setup. Now we're going to make a small one. The guy in here um, makes absolutely huge ones. He makes um, things that size and he puts like half a kilo of material in there and he runs those for ages and ages and ages. We're just going to make a little one like this as a demonstration. And it's really simple. You need a bit of copper uh, and it's copper foil because what's going to happen is that the um, device is going to sediment copper and this foil will get thicker so you don't need an awful lot of it you just need a little bit of copper foil there we go cut it into an L shape and this one you bend round like an S shape 
and stuff it into the bottom of your jar like that. And we can see we've got a little bit protruding out there that we're going to connect to. So we've got our S shape and we're going to connect to that bit protruding there. The next thing you do is put a ton of copper sulfate in there. It's not that much. There we go. Here's our copper sulfate in with our copper. Now, when you're making this battery, the guy recommends that you use a zinc sulfate solution. Doesn't specify how much zinc sulfate, but anything really, just enough to get the action going. He also says you could use a, a drop of sulfuric acid if you want. I've gone for zinc sulfate, obviously, because um, I forgot to bring gloves and <laughs> I don't want to be getting sulfuric acid on my hands. Zinc sulfate's really nice and easy to get hold of and really nice and safe. Now, as the battery runs, what it does is um, replaces the copper with the zinc, and that zinc sulfate solution is going to get more and more concentrated. So we'll go through in a minute how to maintain these batteries, but right now, let's put a bit of zinc sulfate and add a bit of water. And I've only put two teaspoons in, it really doesn't matter how much you put in. And we need enough water to bring that up to about here. So we need to cover the copper sulphate, cover the, co the um, copper strip and leave a bit extra for putting our other side in there. And our other side is going to be a, a zinc, it's going to be a zinc plate. So obviously it's a displacement reaction. And because you've got these things arranged in layers, the gravity keeps those layers separate. The copper sulphate gets eaten up, forming zinc sulphate, and that zinc sulphate Every now and then you're going to have to siphon off and replace with fresh water. So you stick a siphon in, siphon off the zinc sulfate solution, which is just going to get more and more concentrated, and add a bit of water to it, and you can literally drop the copper sulfate in there. So we just fill that up. There we are. And you can see already, it is actually not really mixing that well. Now I've got some sheets of zinc here, and what I'm going to do is just fold that zinc over to form myself a block of zinc. <coughs> and the zinc block needs to go a little bit away from the copper, so that later on when you want to drop copper sulfate in there, you can do that easily. Now obviously, on a small one like this, it's a bit challenging. On a big one like that, no problem at all. You could also, I guess, just grab yourself a sacrificial anode from a marine chandler, uh, and use that. So you used to use a boat anode, connect the boat anode up and you'd be away. And the zinc just needs to go a little bit lower than the copper. Now what I've got here is a bit of butyl rubber and I often use but uh, butyl rubber as a kind of blue tack and I'm basically going to blue tack the zinc onto the side here. just below the level that I've just put it at. That is my battery. Now then, it will salt creep as the zinc sulfate uh, increases uh, and it will evaporate. So in order to stop that, what I've got a bit of here is ordinary machine oil. Pour that gently on the top. There we go. That forms a seal, which will stop that happening. If you want to remove that, so you stick a siphon in, siphon it off, you can drop the copper sulfate straight the way through the oil. It takes about 15 minutes or so to really get going. So we're going to give it a few moments and then we'll see what we've got. Okay, so I've given that 15 minutes and you should be able to quite clearly see the separation now, which is why it's a gravity battery. Everything's being held in that place just by gravity. And you can see the copper sulphate, you can see that the solution above, which was quite blue when we first added the zinc sulphate, actually is clearing up. So over time that will actually go much clearer. 
There's the oil cap that you can see and the zinc is just below the oil and into the um, solution and there's our S-shaped copper. Now to show that this works, what I've done is I've got a little motor here and a black background with a white propeller and if I connect that up, there we go, our little motor is spinning. So that is outputting energy right now. It is a primary battery, so it's going to last as long as the zinc and copper sulphate. So if you want to uh, recharge this in inverted commas, you can also think of it as a mechanically rechargeable battery. That is, you'd replace the copper sulphate until the zinc is gone. When the zinc is gone, you probably want to wash everything out and, and redo it. Uh, but that's based on an 1889 design, and surely we can come up with a better design than that where we have a mechanically rechargeable zinc battery that could be used in um, automotive applications or a moving application. Because obviously something like this, you have to sit it on the shelf and you can't really shake it or you'll disturb the gravity. But like I say, the, the actual action of the battery, the fact that it's pumping out energy and will do so for all that time until that's gone. As I say, the guy put a, a half a kilo of copper sulphate in here and ran it for three months, so he said. Um, We've got to be able to come up with a better design of that that will enable that. And, and so I thought I'd show you that really, so, and hopefully spark some ideas about how to redesign that simple gravity battery. Now in um, output terms, we can see it's actually working. There we go, it's uh, 1.33 volts on that particular setup, so about a volt. Uh, and that's very cool. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is clean anything now, move all of this stuff and show you the second gravity battery, which is a rechargeable battery. Okay, so this one's the rechargeable version. Now the copper zinc is rechargeable in a mechanical sense, you know, you can add it, uh, ingredients to it to keep it going. This one is actually rechargeable in an electrical sense here, connected up to a power supply. Now it's um, much simpler, but it does use zinc bromide. Now we've been uh, talking about zinc bromide in other batteries, but this one's kind of cool. Is you basically arrange yourself a, a jar, and I've got a little thing here, but you could use a big one. And here I've got a carbon electrode. Now what that is, is a bit of metal glued onto this stuff, which is HDPE, high carbon uh, filled HDPE, uh, to protect the metal, and then a bit of carbon painted on top of that to create my carbon electrode, which is circular and sits at the bottom. Now, obviously, that's going to be the positive, because all that bromine negative is going to get attacked, attracted to here. And bromine in solution is a higher density than zinc bromide solution, so the gravity will keep it at the bottom there, making it perfectly safe, which, if you think about it, is really awesome. Now, the battery power is directly related to the, energy, the amount of zinc bromide that you can put in there. And zinc bromide is an absolutely amazing salt, and you can get huge concentrations of it. It's astonishing, actually, how much will dissolve. Now I'm just going to put a random amount in because we're just demonstrating this, but the molarities can go up as far as five, seven moles. It's astounding. <coughs> and I'm only going to make this up to about 60 millilitres. So obviously I want about 60 millilitres of that. And again, I've got myself a piece of zinc that I'm going to fold over and over and that will sit just like the last piece of zinc did, just under the um, solution top. And then we'll top that off with a little bit of motor oil. So we pop that in there. Now I did go through how to make zinc bromide if you can't buy it and there is a video on how to make it from sodium bromide and zinc sulfate both of which are just really ridiculously easy to get hold of so there is my basic gravity cell carbon zinc and here is my zinc bromide solution and we pour one into the other
until it's just covering the zinc. Now, of course, nothing's going to happen because it's not charged. So this one, we need to charge. And there we go. That is the gravity cell. Same thing, bit of motor oil on top to seal everything in. There we go. And although people worry about bromine, this gravity battery keeps everything in check. Now, bromine batteries are really curious things in that they charge not according to the cell voltage, which is 1.85 volts, but according to the surface area of the electrode. And in this case, uh, it's this bottom electrode. It's not very big, and it's about 20 to 50 milliamps per square centimetre is the charge current. So negative to the zinc. <coughs> Positive to the carbon. And we should charge it around about 20 to 50 milliamp hours per square centimetre. And I'm going to turn that on and give it some voltage. And it sucks up quite a lot of amps almost immediately. Now it'll take a little while to start. So what I'm going to do is leave that charging until we can see that bromine formed. And then get back to you. Okay, it's been charging about 10 minutes at quite a high voltage actually. Uh, I'm charging it at 7 volts. But that's for demonstration. You should be able to see the bromine collecting at the bottom there. There's that golden brownish colour. And then there's the layer of the oil on top. Okay, so that's had about 10 minutes to charge. Let's see if we can get anything out of it. We'll use our little motor demonstration. Like I say, the voltage is uh, about 1.8 volts. And there we go. There we go. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So there's our motor spinning away there from our zinc bromide gravity battery. This battery actually is really kind of awesome. Uh, the layer of oil does capture any bromine that might come off, but it also captures any hydrogen. Now, this does off-gas a little bit, particularly if you charge it at the high voltage that I just charged it at. If you charge it at the right voltage, then actually um, it doesn't off gas that much at all and you get this nice banded separation between the bromine and the um, zinc bromide solution uh, but the hydrogen gets captured long enough for the zinc oxide that's formed in here to form zinc hydroxide so it actually captures the hydrogen as well which is very cool um, as it charges obviously what it's doing is reducing the concentration of the zinc bromine uh, zinc bromide in there and so the resistivity goes up. So it's quite a good idea to chuck another salt in there as an assistant salt. And sodium bromide works really well. So five moles of zinc bromide, one mole of sodium bromide would work really, really well, keeping enough ion concentration in the solution that the uh, series resistance of the battery doesn't go too high. And like I say, I give it about a 10 minute charge and, and it's still whizzing away there. So there we go, two gravity batteries, one that's mechanically rechargeable, or if you like a primary, and one that is actually rechargeable. Um, now I apologise if gravity battery made you think of something else, but I thought those were absolutely awesome ideas from the 1800s that really, if we look at again, we must be able to improve. So I thought I would share that with you. I hope it was of interest, and thank you very much for watching.